Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we are going to talk about the development of the placenta. We're going to get into a pretty decent amount of detail on that. And then we're also going to talk about the hormonal functions of the placenta. And we'll throw throughout the video a couple clinical correlations that are important with this. Also, before we get started, check out the actual merch. So we got a bunch of different shirts, all kinds of stuff. If you guys want to go check that out, that's down in the description box. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, engineers, so let's go ahead and get started then. So when we talk about the development of the placenta, it, there's a lot of stuff going on. So let's start from where we left off. If you guys haven't already, go watch again our video on cleavage. We get to the end of that, we start talking about implantation. We're gonna kind of continue with cleavage, just basically, just basically quickly like overviewing that. And then we're gonna talk about implantation. After we talk about the implantation of the blastocyst, we're gonna talk about the differentiation of the trophoblast. Then we'll talk about the formation of the extra embryonic coelom, which will form a chorionic cavity. We'll talk about how that chorionic plate is gonna be important for making the chorionic villi, and eventually what's called the chorionic frondosum, and how that interacts with the endometrial lining, the decidua, which helps us to make the placenta. Then we'll talk about the coverings of all the linings within the uterus with respect to the placenta, the amniotic chorion uh, chorionic membrane. And then we'll finish off talking about the functions of the placenta. So first things first that you have to know, if you guys remember where we left off, we started taking up talking about in the ampulla, the fallopian tubes, right? You have the sperm and the secondary oocyte. It was in metaphase two. If you guys remember, when they fuse, you get the zygote. And then we said that what happens is that that zygote that we have, which has that nice little lining, what was that nice little pink membrane that surrounds it? If you guys remember, that was called the zona pellucida. Okay? So what happens? From here, this zygote starts to divide. And if you remember, it went from a zygote and it divided into two cells. And these are gonna be called the two cell stage. Pretty simple, right? We get this better pink here. And again, those two cells are surrounded by the zona pellucida. Then it cleaves again. And it cleaves into a total of four cells. So then you're gonna get the four cell stage. And again, what's surrounding it? You're gonna have that nice little beautiful zona pellucida. Again, it cleaves again. When it cleaves again, you're gonna get eight cells, right? And then from here, these guys is called the eight cell stage. And again, what do you have behind that? Around that, you're gonna have that nice zona pellucida. One more cleavage happens and you go from eight cells, again, just double, one to two, two to four, four to eight, you're gonna go to 16 cells. Just for the simplicity, I'm not gonna draw 16 perfect cells, we're just gonna draw a clump of cells here. And this clump of cells, which is a hollow ball of cells, it's actually, again, gonna have that zona pellucida around it. It's called the marula. Here's what's important with the marula. The marula is just a ball of cells. But what happens is water, so here's our marula. And if again, you wanna remember, two cell, four cell stage, eight cell stage. Marula is usually 16 or plus cells, right? Then what happens? Water starts moving into the marula. A lot of water moves into the marula and it fills up into a little cavity, a little fluid filled cavity, which we call blastocele. So now if I were to cut this ball of cells, this is what you would see. You would see a group of cells on the outer edge. Okay. And this is going to be called the outer cell mass. And then the water is going to push a bunch of the cells towards one edge here. And they're all going to be mashed up against this center here. So this outer part here is called the outer cell mass and then this inner part here is called the inner cell mass and again what's going to be floating right in here in this little blastocele that's going to be our our blastocele right that's where the water is this makes our blastocyst why is that important the outer cell mass is going to be called the trophoblast that's the part that makes the placenta and the inner cell mass is gonna be what's called the embryoblast. And as you guys have already seen, that helps to make our ectoderm, our endoderm, our mesoderm, which forms the entire structure of the fetus. So that's important. What we need to know now though, is how this little blastocyst implants and attaches to the uterine lining. Because if you guys remember, what's the uterine lining? There's three layers. We're not gonna hit every single one of them, like we're not gonna write them all out. But if you guys remember, orange lining is the endometrium, 
this lining right here, this like a uh, like maroonish colored one, that's the myometrium, and then the most outer layer here, we'll say, which is this purple part, that's going to be the perimetrium. What we want is we want the blastocyst to invade only the endometrium. That's what we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a section. Take a section here and we're going to zoom in on this endometrium, okay? So now here we have our endometrial cells. If you remember, and this is important, usually with your anatomy, you probably may have heard of what's called the stratum basalis. But because we're talking about the part of where a female is actually ovulated, there is fertilization, we're going to undergo what's called decidualization. All that means is what used to be called the stratum functionalis and stratum basalis cells, they get filled with a lot of glycogen. They get bigger. They have a lot of lipids and they just become bigger cells that are more sustainable for fertilization. So we call them decidua. So this bottom row, the basement, so if you imagine here towards this end, that's going to be the basement membrane of the endometrium and this is going to be the apical. So apical here, basement membrane here, okay? The basement part is actually going to be what's called the decidua basalis. And that's just this part to this part. That's all that is, okay? This is the part that replicates and proliferates and makes this purple kind of spongy layer here. This purple layer here is actually made up of two zones. If you guys remember from anatomy, you used to call this the stratum functionalis, right? And this was the stratum basalis, but we're gonna call it the decidua. Now, this right here, the decidua functionalis, it has two parts to it. So we're just going to call this for right now, we'll call it the decidua functionalis. But again, remember, it's actually just going to be important because that's the part where the actual blastocyst will attach and invade. The blastocyst will not invade the decidua basalis. If it does, you can get really bad complications, and that's called placenta accreta. And if it penetrates past the decidua basalis into the myometrium, you can get what's called placenta increta. And then if it goes really, really far past the myometrium into the perimetrium, you can get placenta percreta. And those are very, very bad conditions. The only way to usually treat those is by just taking out the uterus after someone gives birth. And you don't want that, right? So you only want the blastocyst to involve the decidua functionalis, or as you might also hear it, the stratum functionalis. How does it do that? In order for that blastocyst to attach. And again, what are we going to have here? We're going to have this inner cell mass, which we're going to call the embryoblast for right now. Okay, that's our embryoblast. And then outside of this, you're going to have the trophoblast. And again, these are going to differentiate, and we'll go through that stuff a little bit later. For right now, just trust me that we're going to call this outer part here, this outer cell mass, we're going to call this the trophoblast. And then there's bunches of cells here inside of it, which are going to be sandwiched by all this fluid here, which is the blasto uh, seal, which is where all this fluid is sitting here. This is actually going to be the inner cell mass of the embryoblast, right? So outer cell mass is the trophoblast. This inner cell mass is the embryoblast. On the trophoblastic cells, they have little microvilli, little microvilli that allow for them to attach to these little like structures that are protruding from the decidual functionalis. You know what these things are? These are called microvilli. But these little things that are protruding from the endometrial lining here, these little purple gadgets, these are called penopods. Penopods. So we have here the penopods. And these allow for a very loose attachment. So imagine this blastocyst falls into the uterine cavity. It's going to start moving towards that endometrial lining. It has to uh, kind of get grabbed, right? So what grabs it and gives it a nice little loose connection so it doesn't fall out, right? We're just talking theoretically here, making it simple. It's going to get loosely grabbed. That first grabbing is going to be by the microvilli of the trophoblast and the penopods of the endometrial lining, okay? That allows a loose attachment. So we'll call this a loose attachment. This provides a loose attachment. Pretty simple, right? Well, we have a loose attachment. Let's build up a very strong attachment. So how do we do that? We're going to still have the penopod and microvilli connection. Let's come down here. So now let's draw again our structure here. And again, we're going to have the 
embryoblast here. We'll draw this as a clump of cells. And then outside of this, you're going to have the trophoblastic cells. And that's going to be the outer edge. Okay, so again, what does the trophoblastic cells have on them? They have nice little microvilli. And on the penopods, those are going to be allowing for a nice little loose connection, right? The penopods allow for a nice loose connection. Okay. So here, we're going to allow for penopod connection with these microvilli. That's the loose connection. But then guess what starts to happen? On these trophoblastic cells, they also express very important molecules, which are called integrins. Let's draw this here in orange. So here, these guys are going to have these really, really important molecules called integrins. So integrins. That's going to be on the trophoblastic cells. On the endometrial lining, you're going to have selectins. And selectins are going to be these sugar molecules. So you're going to have these carbohydrate-containing selectins. And some of these selectins might actually be covered with a little bit of collagen. Okay, so sometimes you might see selectins and collagen. Now, these two are going to provide a nice tight attachment. And if this is an adequate attachment, there's going to be a release of specific types of chemokines by these trophoblastic cells. So the trophoblastic cells will release chemokines and that will stabilize this strong connection. Okay? So again, Going back, first connection, loose attachment, microvilli of the trophoblasts with the penopods of the endometrium. Second one, you get a stronger connection with the integrins of the trophoblast with the selectins or some collagen tissue of the endometrium. Once that happens, the trophoblasts release chemokines, and these chemokines are going to stabilize this adherence mechanism and allow for this actual blastocyst to start invading into the stroma, invading the endometrium. It's going to start sucking it in. That is so darn cool, right? All right, so now what's happened is we've already allowed for this nice old blastocyst to start invading, right? When it invades, it's going to start, how does it actually do that? So that's the next question. We get attachment. Before we actually start completely invading and this entire thing goes into the endometrial lining, particularly the stroma of the decidua uh, functionalis, it starts differentiating. So now we're at the part we finished implantation. So we did the loose attachment, firm attachment, chemokine signaling, implantation. Boom, we're in, right? But how does it allow for it to really invade into that stroma and really set its place of where it's going to be for a while? How does it do that? And that's based upon the differentiation mechanism. So if you remember, I told you, I'm just going to write it out here. The trophoblast is going to differentiate, OK? And it's going to make two components, all right? One is going to be called the cytotrophoblast. The other one is going to be called the syncytiotrophoblast. There ain't no way I'm spelling that out, okay? The other part is going to be the embryoblast. And remember, if you even want to go back further than this, the trophoblast was the outer cell mass. And the embryoblast was the inner cell mass. The embryoblast is going to be going to make, you'll see later, makes the ectoderm your endoderm, and your mesoderm, which is basically going to be the three linings that makes up the entire human fetus, right? So what happens is once this attaches, the trophoblast starts differentiating, and it makes these two cell light layers. This green layer here, as you can see, this single layer of green cells, that's our cytotrophoblast. Okay, so trophoblast differentiated, and it made this layer here, the cytotrophoblast. But then well, here's what's really cool. The cytotrophoblastic cells, they start really proliferating really, really fast. And then their membranes start breaking down. And their cytoplasm and the nuclei start fusing with other cells. And they make this big pool of like a protoplasm which contains no defined cell borders, like there's no well-defined cell membrane. It's just a pool of cytoplasm and nuclei that are fused together and a nice syncytium. So you see all this blue protoplasm? 
with all of these multinucleated, it's a multinucleated structure which is fusing the cytoplasm and proteins together. That's called the syncytiotrophoblast. So this blue structure here is called the syncytiotrophoblast. The syncytiotrophoblast is so darn cool because it does a couple things. One is it releases all those hydrolytic enzymes that allow for it to break down some of the stromal tissue and invade into the endometrial lining. Isn't that cool? So it, you get the attachment, you get the differentiation, you get this syncytiotrophoblast. What does he start doing? Releasing hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolytic enzymes start breaking down some of the surrounding stromal tissue, allowing for this thing to invade deeper into the endometrial lining. That's pretty darn cool. Here's the second thing that's really cool. Remember that we're assuming that all this is happening, right, a week after ovulation. We're trying to think about it in a perfect situation. If a female gets pregnant, you don't want her to shed that lining. How do we prevent that? Because eventually what happens is the corpus luteum is going to degenerate, right? The corpus luteum will degenerate, it'll become the corpus albicans, and it can't make progesterone. Why is that important? Because if you guys remember from the, our physiology videos, here's a little uterine blood vessel. This uterine blood vessel is super dependent upon progesterone. So whenever there is a decreased concentration of progesterone, what happens to this vessel? It spasms and it leads to ischemia to the surrounding tissue. And then eventually that leads to it rupturing and allowing for the entire endometrial or ischemic lining of the endometrium to just slough off. And that's when they start their menstruation. How do we keep this progesterone levels up? Good old syncytiotrophoblast has got our back. So guess what he does? He knows that it's time that the, estrogen, the uh, progesterone levels will start dropping. So he secretes a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. Human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, will stimulate the corpus luteum and tell the corpus luteum to keep making progesterone. And that increase in progesterone will keep these vessels nice and open and dilated and aligned for perfect amounts of blood flow to the endometrial lining to prevent it from becoming ischemic, necrotic, and sloughing off. Isn't that cool? And this will happen until about 10 or 12 weeks into gestation where the placenta will take over. So that is what I want you guys to remember here. Second thing, cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, right? Second thing, embryoblast. Remember, we started off with just that inner cell mass, and we, remember, we're gonna be a little bit more specific and call it the embryoblast. Eventually, it does develop into the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. But before it does that, it divides into two layers first, which we call the bilaminar disc, which we have here. These pink cells is our epiblast. The brown cells are our hypoblast. Below here, this is our primary yolk sac. And above the epiblast is going to be the amniotic cavity. Okay? This is what I want you guys to remember from this picture. So. We have implantate, we have adhesion, then since trophoblast promotes the invasion into the stromal tissue, it actually secretes human chorionic gonadotropin, which tells the corpus luteum to continue to keep making progesterone so that this endometrial lining doesn't slough off and so that it remains nutritive. Lots of blood flow, proliferative, secretory, lots of glycogen and lipids, all to promote the growth. We also said embryoblasts will divide into the bilaminar disc. Okay, so that's where we're at at this point. What happens next? So, the syncytiotrophoblast will continue to try to invade and spread throughout that stromal tissue, but it'll start to form some spaces in between these finger-like projections. This one here, this one here, this one here. So it's just a space of stromal tissue, right? So it's just the endometrial uh, tissue here. But remember, what's in the endometrium? Lots of blood vessels, right? Well, these little spaces are called lacunae, okay? They're called lacunae. So they're just little spaces which are consisting of stromal tissue at this point in time, okay? Between the syncytiotrophoblast. But to remember, what are these little things here? They're blood vessels, they're uterine vessels. If you guys remember, what are the vessels of the uterus that come in? You get the uterine artery, right? penetrates the myometrium, and then you get your straight artery, and then you get your spiral and coily arteries. These are gonna be all over this endometrial lining, right? 
Guess what this Sinistro Truffle Blast does? This sucker is so darn cool. He releases a lot of these proteolytic enzymes. And guess what it does to the blood vessel lining? It breaks down the blood vessels. And it allows for the blood to seep in to these little spaces. So now the lacuna, or the lacunar spaces, they get filled with blood. And they become little intervillous spaces that we'll talk about ahead, okay? So again, around day nine, so we're gonna start here around day nine, let's say day nine here, you start to form these little spaces called lacuna or lacunar spaces in between the syncytiotrophoblast. Syncytiotrophoblasts release specific hydrolytic enzymes that break down some of the uterine blood vessels and allow for that blood to empty into this lacuna. Now you have these little intervillous spaces. Pretty darn cool, right? Anything change with your embryoblast? No. And we don't really care about that right now. We're focused more specifically on the syncytiotrophoblast and the cytotrophoblast. Okay, so all that's changed from this point to this point is that the lacuna are filling up with blood. Okay, you form these lacunar spaces and they fill up with blood around day nine. Let's go up here, let's go to the next stage. Let's say a couple days later, maybe day 12. All right, we're at day 12 now. All that happens here is that these lacunar spaces, we're gonna actually become a little bit more specific and we're gonna call them intervillous spaces now, okay? Because they're gonna be in, in between these like little syncytial villi. So you're gonna get a lot of these lacunar spaces, we're just gonna call them intervillous spaces now. And they're gonna be filling up with a lot of blood. So intervillous spaces, okay? And they're filling up with a lot of blood. Here's what gets a little bit more interesting. Now, if you remember, we had syncytial trophoblast is this blue structure with all the multinucleated protoplasm. Green is the cytotrophoblastic cells, right? Then inside we had the amniotic cavity, if you guys remember. Amniotic cavity was this blue part here. And then down here was the primary yolk sac. And then pink was the epiblast, brown was the hypoblast. The hypoblast cells, in some books we'll say even the yolk sac, will start making a connective tissue, okay, a mesoderm type of tissue that is going to be between the cytotrophoblast and the amniotic cavity of the primary yolk sac. What is this structure here called? We call this extra embryonic tissue. So this maroon shaped stuff, which is going to be very, very important, is called extra embryonic tissue. So let's bring this out over here. We call this extra embryonic mesoderm. Extremely important and the reason why it's important is because this is going to lead to the formation of a, what's called the chorion. Okay? And the chorion is a very important part of the placenta. It's the fetal component of the placenta. What we're going to talk about is the chorionic frondosum. So what I want you to remember in day 9, lacunar spaces get filled with blood. Day 12, intervillous spaces, we're going to just change their name a little bit. They start getting filled with a little bit more blood and you form an extra embryonic mesoderm, okay, between the cytotrophoblast and this embryoblastic structure here, okay? Let's keep going. Let's go to like day 13, okay, day 13, day 14. All right, so we're going to go to like day 13, day 14, okay? All right, so now we're at day 13, 14. You're looking here, right? And what do we see? Whoa, what happened to all that extra embryonic mesoderm? What the heck, bro? It started breaking down. So some of the extra embryonic mesoderm starts breaking down and you start getting these little septations. They're like extra embryonic little septates, okay? But what happens is eventually all the, there's a space that forms between one layer out here near the cytotrophoblastic layer and one in here which is forming near the amniotic cavity and the primary yolk sac, okay? This is gonna be, this space is called the extra embryonic coelom, which will become the chorionic cavity. So what is this part here called? It is called the extra embryonic coelom. Then you get two layers. You get this outer layer here, right? That is gonna be around the actual cytotrophoblast. This is gonna be the important one. This is the one that we need to know. This is called the somatopleuric 
um, extra embryonic mesoderm. One heck of a thing to say there, right? Now, just for some, like, you know, con being consistent, the inner layer is called the splanchnopleuric part of the extra embryonic mesoderm. And you see this little stalk here that's connecting the somatopleuric to the splanchnopleuric? That's called the connecting stalk. Okay? So just for, you know, being uh, consistent with everything, this the most important part here is the extra embryonic coelom. Okay? It used to just be all mesoderm. The mesoderm starts getting broken down, and some starts adhering to the outer part near the cytotrophoblastic layer, and some adheres to the inner part near the amniotic cavity and primary yolk sac. The one that adheres innermost is the splanchnopleuric layer. The one that adheres to the outer part is the somatopleuric layer of what? The extra embryonic mesoderm. What's the cavity in between? The extra embryonic coelom. What will that become? The chorionic cavity, okay? Just for to be consistent here, I'll write this one out here. So again, what is this layer here, the inner layer? This is called the splanchnopleuric layer. And then again, this structure here between the splanchnopleuric and the somatopleuric is called the connecting stalk. Connecting stalk. All righty. One more thing I want you to remember before we go into the remaining like weeks three all the way to like four to eight. One more thing happens. Look at the cytotrophoblast. What is it doing? It's sending out little projections. So the cells are proliferating, 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 and they're proliferating all the way out to the edge. So what they do is, imagine here, here's your cytotrophoblastic cells. They're proliferating, they're moving all the way out towards the edge around, again, they're penetrating through. See the blue structure there? That's the syncytiotrophoblast. They're penetrating through the syncytiotrophoblast, and then they're proliferating around the edge, around these intervillous spaces. So they move through, going up through the syncytiotrophoblast, penetrate through the syncytiotrophoblast, and move out around the actual intervillous spaces. One more time, just for simplicity's sake, moves the cytotrophoblast moves up through the syncytiotrophoblast, penetrates the syncytiotrophoblast, moves outwards, and again, surrounds the intervillous spaces. What is this shell here, if you will, around the intervillous spaces? That's going to be the cytotrophoblast coming through, penetrating through it. This is called the outer cytotrophoblastic shell. Pretty simple, right? So outer cyto trophoblastic shell, okay? And then simply, simply, what is this one? The inner cytotrophoblastic shell. Super simple, right? So that's what I want you to remember in day 13, 14. Two things. One, you get a coelom. Second thing, the actual cytotrophoblast moves outwards, making this primary villi, primary villi, because it moves through the syncytiotrophoblast, penetrates, and makes an outer cytotrophoblastic shell. So what are these things right here? Just this little, uh, this kind of villus here, that is a primary villi. Primary villus. That is important. So three things, actually, I want you to remember. One, you get the primary villus. Second thing, you get an extra embryonic coelom. Third thing, that primary villus breaks through the syncytiotrophoblast, surrounds the intervillous spaces as the outer cytotrophoblastic shell. Okay? We move forward a little bit more. All right, so now we finished off talking about how we get the primary villi, the uh, extra embryonic coelom, and then we also talked about the outer cytotrophoblastic shell. So again, you're gonna have the outer cytotrophoblastic shell here surrounding your intervillous spaces. Look at it, penetrating through the syncytiotrophoblast, right? So that was originally, there was just this green structure, which used to be the primary villus. Throughout the process of week three, okay? So week three, and then forward, okay? We'll say week three, maybe even go as far as to about week eight, okay, is when we're gonna probably end all this villus system here. So we're trying to make this chorionic villus system, but it gets really cool, okay? So we had the primary villus. What was the primary villus made of? I want you to remember this. Primary villus was just cytotrophoblastic cells, 
That's all it was. It was moving its way up through the syncytiotrophoblast, penetrated, made the shell. The secondary villus, remember what we had? We had this maroon tissue. Remember, it was making that somatopleuric layer. I told you it was going to come in handy. The somatopleuric layer, guess what it starts doing? It starts invading in between the cytotrophoblastic cells, in between that primary villi. Remember, it used to just be a, a green line here going all the way up? Well, now look what happens. The somatopleuric layer decides it's going to invade inside of the primary villus. So there's a core. Imagine here's my hand, right? That's going to be the somatopleuric layer. Covering that is going to be the cytotrophoblastic cells. And then covering that is going to be the syncytiotrophoblastic cells. Because look, here's the core. That's going to be the, uh, again, the mesoderm, the extraembryonic mesoderm, the somatopleuric layer. Surrounding it is the cytotrophoblast, the green. And then what's surrounding that? The syncytiotrophoblast. But what happens to the cytotrophoblastic uh, cells? It still penetrates through the syncytiotrophoblast and forms a shell around those intervillous spaces. In some areas it doesn't, and that's where you get these things we'll talk about very briefly later, called anchored villi and floating villi. So in other words, if you don't have this, anchoring it to the outer cytotrophoblastic shell, guess what it does? It just kind of floats around, right? But if it's anchored, it's not gonna move, right? So that's the kind of the big difference there. And it's just a difference in microanatomy kind of stuff, okay? Microscopic structures. All right, good. So again, what I want you to remember here, the extra embryonic mesoderm starts invading in where this primary villus is, and now this is a secondary villi. So now you're gonna get your secondary villus. So secondary villus is again, all I want you to remember is the somatic pleuric part of the extra embryonic mesoderm surrounded by cytotrophoblastic cells, surrounded by syncytiotrophoblastic cells. And again, you're filling this chorionic, I'm sorry, you're filling this intervillous spaces with all that uterine blood vessels. It's just starting to collect there. Okay, beautiful stuff. Now, throughout week three, what are we doing? We progress from primary villus to secondary villus. How does it get any better? Well, guess what happens? Extra embryonic mesoderm, if you guys remember, mesoderm can form blood vessels. So guess what starts happening? Those mesodermal cells, they start differentiating and they make capillaries, small little capillaries. So capillaries start forming all over the place. So what do we have here in this part? Notice that again, you see these little, these uh, uh, maroon-like projections? That's still going to be your extra embryonic mesoderm. It's penetrating in surrounded by the green, which is the cytotrophoblastic cells, surrounded by this blue, which is the syncytiotrophoblastic cells. What's different though? Again, some of the extra embryonic mesoderm gets converted into blood vessels. What are some of these blood vessels? Okay, let's, let's talk about this now. So imagine here, right? Imagine here we have kind of like a villus here, okay? Here's a part of the chorionic Plate. So here you're going to have your chorionic plate here. This is a thick part of chorion. So this is your chorionic plate. Okay? And off of this chorionic plate, you get these chorionic villi, which is going to make what's called your chorionic frondosum. From here, right, it's connected through this umbilical cord. So here you're going to have your umbilical cord. And the umbilical cord is going to have two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. Right? So this is usually by like the end of week three, you start to get this embryonic folding. So we're just trying to show you that now at this point, at the end of week three, you're already going to have this embryonic folding. Okay? But now it's no longer a connecting stalk, it's actually going to be the umbilical cord. So we have the umbilical cord here. Okay? And in the umbilical cord, it used to be just extra embryonic mesoderm. Right? Remember, remember it was just this, it was the connecting stalk. But then what happens is, you start breaking down some of that, and then you're going to have it become blood vessels. So again, that's what happens. The extra embryonic mesoderm, which was a part of the connecting stalk, is actually going to help to make the umbilical cord. That's going to start converting or differentiating into blood vessels. What kind of blood vessels does it differentiate into? Two umbilical arteries. Let's write that down. So what do you have running in the umbilical cord? You have two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein running through there. From the umbilical arteries, they move out into the chorionic plate. 
And these arteries here, which are on this chorionic plate, are called the chorionic arteries. Okay? So then you're going to get these chorionic arteries. Then they'll move up into these villi and become eventually what's called cotyledon arteries. Okay? So again, a blood flow from the fetus, you're going to have through the umbilical cord is the umbilical arteries. They're going to move out and become the chorionic arteries. Chorionic arteries will move into these actual chorionic villi and make the cotyledon arteries. Now here's where it's really cool. The only thing that's changed here is that instead of this being all extra embryonic mesoderm, we have blood vessels within the center of it, okay? We have blood vessels within the center of this. So these are just now going to be our tertiary villus. These are tertiary chorionic villus. Now, again, if you were to kind of zoom in on this, imagine here, we have the chorionic membrane here. Here's the umbilical cord, okay? Here, we'll draw a couple We'll draw another villus here, and we'll have another villus here. What do we have coming up through here? Through the umbilical cord, we're going to have two umbilical arteries, okay? They're going to branch out into the chorionic membrane and form the chorionic arteries. From the chorionic arteries, they're going to branch into the villi, and these are going to be called the cotyledon arteries. What's surrounding, just to be consistent here, what's surrounding this extra embryonic mesoderm. Cytotrophoblastic cells. And then what's surrounding that? This incisiotrophoblast. And then what's here in between this villi and this villi and this villi? Blood. What kind of blood? Maternal blood, which is in these intervillous spaces. Now here's where it should all come together, guys. Guess what's happening here between this? The exchange. So this is where the fetus is dropping off its CO2. It's dropping off its urea, its uric acid, all the breakdown products. It's picking up oxygen. It's picking up glucose, amino acids, lipids, water-soluble vitamins, even antibodies like IgG antibodies to allow for passive immunity. And sadly, and sometimes, we obviously know that there can be the transfer of viruses and bacteria and parasites, right? We'll talk about torch infections very briefly. But this is what's so cool. So when we talk about by the end of like week three, getting ready to go into week four, what do we have? This is our tertiary villus. This is the exchange system. And it's like this until about week 20. All that happens at week 20, and we'll talk about that, is you, your, your uh, cytotrophoblastic layer it regresses, it breaks down. That's all that happens. But this is your placenta. So your placenta is basically this structure here. And there's also, again, your decidua bis house. But the whole perp, uh, cool stuff here is just looking at the exchange process. What do you have to move through? Well, in order for the stuff to go from the mother's blood to the fetus's blood, it has to go through the syncytiotrophoblast, through the cytotrophoblast, through the chorionic uh, uh, lamina, and then into the actual baby's blood vessels. And opposite, it would have to go through the baby's blood vessel, through the chorionic actual tissue here, and then through the cytotrophoblast, through the syncytiotrophoblast, and into the maternal blood. So that's pretty cool to see how that all works out. Okay, so by the end of week three, let's say like by week four, you're gonna have your tertiary villus. Okay, and it's going to be like that for a while. The only thing that changes along the way is a couple things. Okay, one thing that happens maybe around the fourth or fifth month of gestation is you get these things called placental septa. Okay, so tissue from the decidual membrane starts branching in. Okay, so imagine here there's going to be a placental fissure, placental fissure there's a septa that moves all the way in here and all it does is it separates some of the tertiary villi to only be in one little area. So now you're gonna have tertiary villi just in this area, tertiary villi in this area. It's basically housing tertiary villi into separate little rooms. That's all it is. And those separate rooms, which can consist of maybe two or three 
tertiary villi are called cotyledons. That's all it is. Cotyledons is basically going to be formed by this decidual septa, which separates out maybe two, maybe three tertiary villi into individual little chambers. Okay? That is what your cotyledons are. So it's just going to be a little bit of a specialized, like, um, separation uh, like uh, kind of structure. So cotyledons. And you get about 15 to 20 of these. You get about 15 to 20 cotyledons. So around the fourth or fifth month, the only thing that's changing is that some of the decidual tissue will form septa that separate out some of the tertiary chorionic villi, maybe only two or three per um, septation, okay? And you, these are going to be these little septations where the decidual tissue will get more swollen, fill up with glycogen, fill up with lipids, and it'll just become a little bit more enlarged, consisting of maybe two or three tertiary chorionic villi. That little area is called a cotyledon. And you get about 15 to 20 cotyledons generally. That happens maybe fourth or fifth month. So this is around the fourth or fifth month. Okay, you can get these cotyledons. But we've already kind of pretty much defined our structure of the tertiary villus, right? The tertiary villus, we already kind of defined this pretty darn well. What is this little maroon membrane here? That's the chorionic membrane, right? What's running within that? The nice little chorionic vessels and cotyledon vessels, okay? What's surrounding the actual blood vessels? Well, again, you have the chorionic tissue, uh, the extra embryonic tissue. Then you have the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast. And then again, you're going to have your intervillous spaces. And again, this is where the exchange is going. Okay? Remember, I told you that it changes. This is usually, you know, anywhere less than 20 weeks. Okay? So it's usually from week four until about week 20. Okay? Greater than or equal to 20 weeks gestational age. What happens is the cytotrophoblastic layer regresses. So you lose that cytotrophoblastic layer. So that's all that happens is that the cytotrophoblastic layer, cytotrophoblast regresses. That's all that happens around week 20. And it just becomes a thinner membrane to allow for more efficient exchange. That's all it is, because now look, Instead of you having another layer there, you're down one layer. And it's just going to allow for a very quick and more efficient exchange process by decreasing it a layer, okay? So again, where we left off, primary villi around days 13, 14 usually forms, along with the extra embryonic coelom. And again, what we have here is the outer side of trophoblastic shell. Again, week three, beginning from week three, going all the way to about week four. It progresses from primary villi to secondary villus, which is just the cytotrophoblast with the core of extra embryonic mesoderm, particularly somatopleuric layer. From there, it progresses to a tertiary villus, which is where all that happens is this extra embryonic mesoderm starts getting converted into specialized blood vessels, okay? Also, the connecting stalk will actually start to become the umbilical cord, and again, that's filled with extra embryonic mesoderm. So it gets converted into blood vessels. What kind? Two umbilical arteries, one umbilical vein. Okay? And again, that's going to be surrounded by the amniotic cavity if you really wanted to know that. Okay? But tertiary villus is usually formed by the end of week four. We said that the tertiary villus, it really doesn't change much. Okay? All we said is that by the fourth or fifth month, you form these things called cotyledons. And if you remember, that's basically when the decidual tissue forms septa that separate out maybe two, maybe three tertiary villi into one little compartment. And again, the decidual cells get swollen, they get filled with a lot of fluid, they get filled with cholesterol, glycogen, lipids, and they become this big swollen little area, which we call a cotyledon. And you get about 15 to 20 cotyledons around the fourth or fifth month. If you also want to be a little bit more specific, we said that generally the tertiary villus is these layers that we described. The extra embryonic tissue, cytotrophoblast, syncytiotrophoblast, intervillous space, right? That's really just the layers that we were talking about, uh, usually between week four until about week 20. If we get after week 20, we want the exchange to be a little bit more efficient, so all that happens is that we get rid of the cytotrophoblastic layer. 
One more thing that you should remember, and I talked about it briefly, is that around we from week four all the way to about week eight, the only thing that's changing with the tertiary villi is that they start branching more. Again, all that's really happening here from weeks four to about eight is the villi become more extensive. So what does it mean? It's really simple. Here's just one villi, right? And within the center of that you have, if you really want to remember, around it you have the cytotrophoblast. Around that you have the syncytiotrophoblast. And then again, within the core of it, you have the vessels, right? Here's your artery, arterioles, little capillaries there, right? So super simple structure. Throughout weeks four to eight, the layers still stay the same. The only thing that changes is that this becomes more branched. So then instead of it being just like one little thing, it like branches into multiple extensions. But it's still covered by what? Cytotrophoblast. And it's still covered by syncytiotrophoblast. And in the center of it, it's still going to have the vessels. But what are you doing here by making it more branched? You're increasing the surface area. So you're increasing the surface area for exchange. So that's all that's really happening is from weeks four to eight. It's still the same layering. That's not changing. It's just it's becoming more branched of a structure to increase the surface area for diffusion, okay, and transport of different things. So we end of week four, you have a tertiary villa system. If you really want to be specific from weeks four to eight, it's still the same tissue linings, but it becomes more extensive. Around the fourth or fifth month, you get cotyledon formation, which is just separating these villi into multiple different little chambers, 15 to 20 of them, okay? And that puts a bunch of different villi within a little individual chamber, okay? And a lot of the cells blow up, they get big filled with cholesterol, water, glycogen, lipids, I've already repeated like a million times, right? And then the last thing is after 20 weeks, your cytotrophoblastic layer regresses to allow for the exchange even more efficient, okay, and that means. Capiche? All right. The last thing that we got to talk about here is that we, uh, before we get into the, the basic functions, is just these linings. I want you guys to be aware of these linings real quick. Because we're talking about this in a very zoomed in, microscopic type of view. But I want you to get an idea of what it kind of looks like from a bigger view, okay? So here we have the uterus. And inside of the uterus, you got the baby, right? So there's the baby, okay? Then, what do we have here that's connecting the baby to the actual uterine lining there? This is going to be the umbilical cord, right? So that's our umbilical cord. And again, if you remember running within that, if you really want to be specific, you have the extra embryonic mesoderm. And that runs out here, and then you get your chorionic structure there. Okay? So, what do we have here? We're going to have the umbilical cord, and then here, you're gonna have this little wavy membrane. And this wavy membrane is basically a bunch of these structures. That's really what it is. It's a bunch of these structures that are protruding into the uterine lining. And this is called the, it's the chorion, because this is basically the chorionic villus, tertiary chorionic villus. But all of them together make up what's called the chorionic frondosum. Okay, so it's called the chorionic frondosum, which is just all this extensive tertiary villi structure that was derived from the chorionic plate protruding and interacting with the decidual lining. Second thing is, again, what is this orange lining that it's supposed to be interacting with? This is called the decidua basalis. And the decidua basalis and the chorionic frondosum, guess what they make? The placenta. The chorionic frondosum is this tertiary villus system. That's the fetal component. And the decidual basalis with the intervillous spaces is the maternal component. Those two combinations make up the placenta. The other part here is, again, your, this blue membrane is the amniotic membrane. The red membrane is the chorionic membrane. And then you have this little orange membrane that's surrounding the chorionic membrane, or the chorionic plate here. And this is going to be 
called the decidua capsularis. So this one right here is called the decidua capsularis. And then the one where there's no attachment or no fetal involvement is called the decidua parietalis. Eventually, as the fetus get, grows and grows and grows and grows, the decidua capsularis will fuse with the decidua parietalis and obliterate the entire uterine cavity. So that's eventually what will happen over time. Okay, one last thing here, just so that we're uh, super like specific. Chorionic frondosum is this part of the chorion interacting with the decidua basalis, making the part of the placenta. The chorion over here, it doesn't have a lot of this kind of like syncytiotrophoblastic structure and this nice little villi structure. That breaks down and becomes a very thin, very flat membrane, which we call the chorionic leave. So this membrane here, this part of the chorion that's on the abembryonic pole over here, this is called the chorionic leave. Okay, so that's important to remember. So what I want you to remember out of these structures, decidua, capsularis, is surrounding the chorionic membrane here, the chorionic leave if you want to be specific. Decidua basalis is interacting with the chorionic frondosum. Those two combinations together give you the placenta. And then the part of the decidua that's not interacting with any part of the fetus, okay, or the placenta, is called the decidua parietalis. But do realize, as the fetus expands, the decidua capsularis and the decidua parietalis will fuse together and obliterate any part of the uterine cavity, okay? Chorionic leave is, again, this part of the chorion where there's no extensive villi system. All right, so what are the functions of the placenta in a very basic way? Because we've talked about a lot of stuff with the development of the placenta, an extensive amount. But what I want you guys to understand is the metabolic functions of the placenta. So very simply, when we talk about the metabolic functions, remember that it's primarily playing a role in gas exchange. So this, what do I mean? So it's actually going to be dropping off oxygen, right? So it's dropping off oxygen to the fetus. And then here's going to be from the mother. Dropping off oxygen and picking up CO2. That's one simple thing. The other one is it's going to be delivering nutrients, so nutrient delivery. And some of these nutrients can be delivered very simply through like a simple diffusion process. But truly it's mainly the gases. Most of it is going to be like facilitated diffusion or some type of active transport. But this is going to be things like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, even water soluble vitamins. So uh, the B vitamins, okay? And even IgG antibodies. Now, a lot of these are taken across the actual placental membrane by either facilitated diffusion, like glucose. Um, a lot of them are done via some type of um, you know, active transport or penocytosis type of mechanism. One of the big ones is IgG antibodies. Why is this important? IgG antibodies are important because they help to confer what's called passive immunity. Okay, in other words, these are antibodies that the mother has already made against specific types of pathogens of some form and is allowing for the fetus to have those antibodies so that they can be protected against multiple different types of foreign antigens whenever they're exposed to it. So that's the beautiful thing, is it provides this uh, kind of a natural passive immunity for the baby. In some ways, this can be extremely dangerous, and one of the dangerous things is there is a condition where certain IgG antibodies, particularly um, that are against RH, um, we call them the D, the, you know, the Duffy antigen. If you have these RHD immunoglobulin IgG antibodies, that the mother makes because she's RH negative and that she had a baby previously who was RH positive, or the mother was RH negative and she had a spontaneous abortion of a baby that was RH positive, what happens is the mother produces antibodies against those red blood cells that are RH antigen positive and can cause destruction. So this is a really very dangerous one that you have to be careful with. That's why whenever somebody does have this, okay, like a mother, 
okay, if they're trying to protect them, there is a medication that you can give, which is called Rogan. And it's basically an anti um, IgG antibody that are directed against the RH antigens. They give this to mothers who are RH negative and a baby's RH positive, so that way whenever the placenta breaks away, right, during the actual third stage of delivery, whenever some of that blood does escape into the mother's circulation, there isn't this immunological reaction. We can block it, okay? If not, and the mother's already alloimmunized, we have to check the baby's uh, middle cerebral artery blood flow, and they do that through a Doppler. Um, and they, they calculate velocity based upon fetal anemia. We're not gonna get into all that though right now, okay? So that's some of the big things. Now, there is unfortunate things that can be transported across the actual fetal membrane that we have to be aware of. And you wanna remember that um, as though as the, the, what they call it the TORCH series. So um, you can remember T-O-R-C-H. So T is toxoplasmosis. Okay, this is toxoplasmosis gondii, and it can actually cross the placental membrane as well, cause significant fetal uh, defects and damage, and it's extremely dangerous. Um, usually if someone does have this, you try to treat them with spiromycin, unless the baby's been infected, then you treat them with another drug called um, promethamine and sulfadiazine. But again, this is something that you wanna be careful of. It can cross that placental barrier. Others, so what do we mean here? This could be things like HIV, this could be things like syphilis. It could be things like um, hepatitis, uh, particularly hepatitis B virus. These are also other things that can be transported across the placenta. Don't like that. R, rubella. Rubella is a very dangerous one that can cause a lot of cardiac and congenital defects as well, like hearing loss. Okay, C, CMV, cytomegalovirus. This is another one that can cause a lot of problems as well. And then H is going to be your herpes simplex virus. Okay, and this could be like, you know, type two. So these are some things that you have to be very, very careful of. And another really, really dangerous one that people are actually should be aware of nowadays is the Zika virus. Okay, the Zika virus does have the capability of being transferred uh, vertically as well. So don't forget also about the Zika virus. So these are some things that can actually cross the placenta and we have to be very careful of. There's many other kinds of like, you know, bacteria like Listeria monocytogenes that can come from like pasteurized like products and very like, um, you know, cold, like uh, meats, like lunch meats. But again, for the most part, the ones you have to worry about is the viruses. They have the ability to cross that placental membrane. Okay, so big, big functions, gas exchange, nutrient delivery, Okay, and what else? Okay, waste, waste removal. Okay, so they remove a lot of different things like um, urea, uric acid, okay, and, and so on and so forth, okay? More different types of waste products that's not super, super in in integral to this lecture, okay? What else? So we got metabolic functions and hormonal functions. This is a big one. It makes a lot of different hormones. But what are some of the big ones? What are some of the big, big ones? So one of them is estrogen and progesterone, right? We talked a little bit about these, that they were made a little bit later, you know, more around towards like, uh, we could say generally around the 10th to 12th week of gestation, right? And what, what is their big function here? If you guys remember, they are going to take over for the corpus luteum of pregnancy and tell the endometrial lining to thicken. So it's gonna thicken up that lining, providing a very nutritive environment by increasing the, the vasculature to this area, making sure that the baby gets enough nutrition. So it's gonna increase a lot of the secretions and it's gonna make sure that the baby is not in, harmed in any way or affected by anything from the external environment. So it's gonna plug up that cervix, right, with a big old mucus plug. So those are some of the things that it's really gonna provide. As well as, just very simply, development of the fetus. So it's also gonna play a very crucial role with development of the fetus. What's some other things? Well, another thing is it can make, uh, you can get thyroid hormone, okay? In addition to from the placenta, which makes a little bit, you can also get this from the maternal, uh, you know, uh, thyroid hormone as well. So thyroid hormone, what is it going to do? Big big thing here is it's going to promote the development 
of the central nervous system. This is extremely important. So it plays a role in CNS development. As you guys know, with a lack of thyroid hormone, there's a risk of cretinism which is a complete, uh, incomplete development of the central nervous system, which can lead to mental retardation. All right, what else? Another one. This one's actually pretty freaking cool. Human placental lactogen. What human placental lactogen does is, is it does a couple things. It inhibits, it basically decreases insulin sensitivity, right? So it alters the insulin release, okay? So it's going to alter insulin release from the pancreas, it's also going to act on the mother's cells. So this is going to be the mom's cells, and it's going to do a couple things. One is it's going to promote lipolysis, which is going to give a lot of fatty acids for the baby. It's also going to promote gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis. And this is basically going to provide lots of glucose for the baby and lots of fatty acids for the baby. Okay, but here's another thing it does to the mom cells. It makes the mom cells resistant to insulin. So even though the mom's gonna produce insulin, it's gonna try to decrease insulin production, but even if there is insulin production, the mom's cells are gonna become resistant to the insulin so that it doesn't shuttle all this glucose back into the mom cells. So now, why is that important? You're gonna have lots of glucose, lots of fatty acids to deliver to the fetus across the placenta. What a beautiful mechanism that is. Okay, another one is called relaxin. And relaxin is basically what it does. It relaxes specific ligaments of the pubic synthesis. So it relaxes the ligaments. It increases the laxity of those ligaments. The particular one is the pubic Synthesis, why is this important? You wanna widen out that actual pelvic inlet, right? And pelvic outlet so that you can allow for a big old baby to come plunging through there. What else? It also can make corticotropin releasing hormone in addition to the mother's pituitary gland making it. This is important because it plays a role in the production of cortisol eventually. CRH stimulates ACTH, which stimulates cortisol production. Cortisol is important because it plays a role in lung development and surfactant production. So why is that important? If a baby is born, right, cortisol production is usually the highest around the 34th week. So if for some reason, the baby is actually going to be having like it's a preterm labor, the premature rupture of the membranes, let's say preterm premature rupture of membranes, so it's before 34 weeks, let's say, that cortisol is not going to be high enough for allow, to allow for surfactant production. The lungs are going to be completely ready to go. What that means is if the baby's born without having that proper surfactant production, those alveoli are going to be collapsed. And it's going to be almost near impossible for the baby to get enough strength through its diaphragm and intercostal muscles to pull air in to pop open those alveoli. And that's going to lead to what's called infant respiratory distress syndrome. So that's why it's important that we have enough cortisol, especially around the 34th week, so that we can get that surfactant production nice and high so we get good fetal lung development. All right, engineers, so that pretty much covers everything that you guys need to know about the development of the placenta and the function of the placenta. I hope it made sense. And I know it was a lot of stuff that we went through, a lot of drawings but I really hope that it made sense and it hit home the point of everything that you guys need to do well in your exams, to do well in future practice. Um, if you guys did like this video and if it did help, and if you guys did enjoy it, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please also subscribe. If you guys are interested in getting into contact with us, just wanna to talk to us, we have a Instagram, we have a Facebook, we also even have a Patreon account, we have, again, uh, links to all the merchandise that we have down in the description box. Go check that out. And uh, any help that you guys can provide, we would truly appreciate it. All right, engineers, love you guys. And as always, until next time.